If you want to learn something or you want to change your nervous system in any way, whether or not it's because of some impairment or because of something that you want to acquire, a cognitive skill, a motor skill, an emotional skill, the first thing is recognizing what that thing is. And that often can be the hardest thing to identify. But the brain has these self-recognition mechanisms, and those self-recognition mechanisms are not vague, uh, spiritual, or mystical, or even psychological concepts. They are neurochemicals. We're going to talk next about the neurochemicals that stamp down particular behaviors. There are specific chemicals that when we are consciously aware of a change we want to make, or even just that we want to make some change, chemicals are released in the brain that allow us the opportunity to make those changes. Now, there are specific protocols that science tells us we have to follow if we want those changes to occur. When we pay careful attention, there are two neurochemicals, neuromodulators as they're called, that are released from multiple sites in our brain that highlight the neural circuits that stand a chance of changing. Now, it's not necessarily the case that they're going to change, but it's the first gate that has to open in order for change to occur. And the first neurochemical is epinephrine, also adrenaline. Epinephrine is released from a region in the brainstem called locus ceruleus. Locus ceruleus sends out these little wires we call axons such that it hoses the entire brain essentially in this neurochemical epinephrine. Now it's not always hosing the brain with epinephrine. It's only when we are in high states of alertness that this epinephrine is released. But the way this circuit is designed, it's very non-specific. It's essentially waking up the entire brain. And that's because the way that epinephrine works by binding particular receptors is to increase the likelihood that neurons will be active. So no alertness, no neuroplasticity. However, alertness alone is not sufficient. As we would say, it's necessary, but not sufficient for neuroplasticity. The most important thing for getting plasticity is that there be epinephrine, which equates to alertness, plus the release of this neuromodulator acetylcholine. Now, acetylcholine is released from two sites in the brain. One is also in the brainstem, the parabigeminal nucleus, and that area sends wires, these axons, up into the area of the brain that filters sensory input. So we have this area of the brain called the thalamus, and it is getting bombarded with all sorts of sensory input all the time. I create a cone of attention, and what that cone of attention reflects is that acetylcholine is now amplifying the signal and essentially making that signal greater than all the signal around it. What we call signal to noise goes up. Acetylcholine acts as a spotlight. Epinephrine for alertness, acetylcholine spotlighting these inputs. There needs to be this third component, and the third component is acetylcholine released from an area of the forebrain called nucleus basalis. If you have acetylcholine released from the brainstem, acetylcholine released from nucleus basalis, and epinephrine, you can change your brain. Not only will the nervous system change, it has to change. It absolutely will change. The most important thing for people to understand if they want to change their brain, you cannot just passively experience things. And repetition can be important, but the way to use repetition to change your brain is fundamentally different. So now let's talk about how we would translate all the scientific information and history into some protocols that you can actually apply. And your brain does not distinguish between doing things out of love or hate, anger or fear. From the standpoint of epinephrine and getting alert and activated, it doesn't really matter. Epinephrine is a chemical. All of those promote autonomic arousal and the release of epinephrine. So I think for most people, if you're feeling not motivated to make these changes, the key thing is to identify not just one, but probably a kit of reasons, several reasons as to why you would want to make this particular change. And being drawn toward a particular goal that you're excited about can be one. Also being motivated to not be completely afraid, ashamed, or humiliated for not following through on a goal is another come up with two or three things, fear-based perhaps, love-based perhaps, or perhaps several of those in order to ensure alertness, energy, and attention for the task. And that brings us to the attention part. So what are some ways that you can increase acetylcholine? And there you want to increase focus. How do you increase focus? You know, people are so familiar with sitting down, reading a couple pages of a book and realizing that none of it sunk in. The best way to get better at focusing is to use the mechanisms of focus that you were born with. The key principle here is that mental focus follows visual focus. You can either look at a very small region of space with a lot of detail and a lot of precision, 
or we can dilate our gaze and we can see big pieces of visual space with very little detail. It's a trade-off. We can't look at everything at high resolution. Think about a bird picking up seeds on the beach or on concrete. That bird's head is up here and its eyes are on the side of its head and yet it has this tiny beak that can quickly pick up these little seeds off the ground with immense precision. So how do they do it? How do they create this focus or this awareness of what's in front of them? And it turns out as they lower their head, their eyes very briefly move inward in what's called a virgin's eye move. Their eyes can't actually translocate in their head. They're fixed in the skull, just like yours and mine are. But when we move our eyes slightly inward, maybe you can tell that I'm doing it like, like so, basically shortening or, or making the interpolary distance as it's called smaller, two things happen. Not only do we develop a smaller visual window into the world, but we activate a set of neurons in our brainstem that trigger the release of both norepinephrine, epinephrine, and acetylcholine. Norepinephrine is kind of similar to epinephrine. So in other words, when our eyes are relaxed in our head, when we're just kind of looking at our entire visual environment, moving our head around, moving through space, when our eyes move slightly inward toward a particular visual target, our visual world shrinks, our level of visual focus goes up, and we know that this relates to the release of acetylcholine and epinephrine at the relevant sites in the brain for plasticity. Now, what this means is that if you have a hard time focusing your mind for sake of reading or for listening, you need to practice and you can practice focusing your visual system. Now, this works best if you practice focusing your visual system at the precise distance from the work that you intend to do for sake of plasticity. How would this look in the real world? Let's say I am trying to concentrate on something related to science. I'm reading a science paper and I'm having a hard time. It's not absorbing. I might think that I'm only looking at the paper that I'm reading. I'm only looking at my screen, but actually my eyes are probably darting around a bit or I'm gathering information from too many sources in, in the visual environment. Spending just 60 to 120 seconds focusing my visual attention on a small window of my screen, meaning just on my screen with nothing on it, but bringing my eyes to that particular location increases not just my visual acuity for that location, but it brings about an increase in activity in a bunch of other brain areas that are associated with gathering information from this location. So put simply, if you want to improve your ability to focus, practice visual focus.